Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to be talking about a sign of the times that has happened in Jerusalem, um, a sign at least for the Jews. So I, th I think it probably should be for us as well. Uh, here in this video that you can see, I'm not going to play the video, but I'm going to show you a few frames here. There is a fox that's running on the Temple Mount. You can see it moving right there. Okay. Um, we're going to read why that would be a sign. Maybe some of you already know, but we're going to get into it in just a minute. And then uh, later, I'm going to go over this talk by Ezra Taft Benson called Jews to Return, uh, Jews Return to Palestine and Fulfill Prophecy. Written in 1950, April General Conference, which was almost exactly two years um, from the time that Israel became a nation back in 1948. All right, so... This is a Israel's 365 article. It's called Foxes on Mount Zion Bring Biblical Book of Lamentations to Life, written by Adam Eliyahu Berkowitz. He's the one that I interviewed last year. You can find him on my playlist called Special Guests. And uh, this occurred on January 17th um, of all days. There's another 17 uh, of this year, 2023. So that was just a couple weeks ago. Okay. It says, a rare sighting of a fox running across Mount Zion conjured up images described in the Book of Lamentations Tuesday morning. Jewish tradition teaches that the appearance of foxes on the Temple Mount is proof that the third temple shall be built. So, for them, uh, this is significant. Uh, and it seems like there's been a lot of things happening over there that's significant to Jews. I think, like I said, I think if it's significant to them, it should probably be significant to us. Um, even if, you know, it may not be part of our doctrine, I think the bigger picture is that the Lord is preparing their minds for the second coming. They're, they're getting in a messianic state of mind. They're expecting uh, Messiah to come. And uh, we know what's going to happen. They will accept him uh, when he comes. Uh, we read that in, in Zechariah. Christ is going to show his uh, pierced hands and feet, and then they're going to realize who he is and accept him. Um, I don't know that all of them will, uh, just because the statements that we've re read about the millennium, there's going to be all different religions. I don't know if all Jews everywhere are going to accept him. I guess that's yet to be seen. But anyway, that's why... I find this interesting, um, even though it may not be specific to our church, just because it seems like the Lord's preparing them. Okay, so let's continue. Quote, I only saw one fox, but I assume there are more in the area, said Joshua Wander, or Wander, a resident of the Mount of Olives who spotted the animal running through <laughs> through the cemetery. Uh it is, it is definitely unusual to see them, he added. That's why I filmed it. It's something I rarely see. Maybe it's a sign. You know, when it comes to signs, I, I mean, I don't need to tell you, but you usually have two camps, right? You have the camp that's like, oh, no, it's just a coincidence. They never see anything as a sign. Or it has to, like, break the laws of physics or science, nature, before they accept it as a sign. Whereas... The other camp would view certain things that are unlikely uh, and also things that go along with feeling the spirit and uh, just simply knowing that it's a sign, even though it might be something small. Um, sometimes it's specific, like like in this case, this seems pretty specific. And uh, the article says that it's a rare sighting, so it's not something that just happens every day. And uh, you kind of recognize through the spirit that it is a sign. You know, it's a sign of where we're at. So that's how uh, he's taking it. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's continue. The image of foxes on the Temple Mount was described in the Book of Lamentations, which some biblical scholars believe was written by the prophet Jeremiah. So Lamentations was written. This has to do with the destruction of, of Jerusalem uh, the first time by the Babylonians when Solomon's temple was destroyed. All right, then it says, Lamentations 5.18, Because of Mount Sion, uh, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. The Hebrew word used in the verse, and here's the Hebrew word. I, I've been, 
it, I'm okay. I'm not gonna lie. It's been a couple months since I've been working on uh, learning Hebrew, so I've already forgotten the sounds. But I'm pretty sure that this letter right here is like makes an L sound. Okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'll I'll pick it back up sometime. So the Hebrew word used in this verse, which is this right here, is most accurately translated as foxes. And uh, when you go to the King James Version, that's, that is how it translates it. Translates it. it says, because of the mount, sorry, because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. So this is Lamentations 5, verse 18. In our scriptures, the chapter heading says, Jeremiah recites in prayer the sorrowful condition of Zion. All right. Okay, so... This verse appears in the fifth and final chapter of Lamentations, which culminates in the prophecy that Jerusalem will return to its former days of glory. Okay, and that's what they're that's what they're looking for right now. Um, Jerusalem was rebuilt when they <clears throat> were <clears throat> when the exiles were allowed to return from um, the Babylonian captivity. They built the city again. They built the second temple. <clears throat> but there's a third time that this happens. And you could argue that, and I think it'd be right to say that the city has been built now, right? Um, it's always been there. It's mostly been under the possession of the Muslims. Um, during various times, it was under uh, Christian control, right? But... um. I would say definitely, definitely uh, from the time of the Six-Day War in 1967, which is when Israel, um, uh, uh, they they conquered that area and they, they took Jerusalem. I, I would say that, you know, that's probably when you could consider Jerusalem as being under, being rebuilt. And, all, you know, the years that have followed since that time because they keep developing it. So Jerusalem itself seems to have been rebuilt and, uh, you know, the walls, so to speak. Uh, but the temple, no. Um, at least not the third temple. You know, and I, I still cannot tell. Okay, I cannot tell. There's nothing that really ex explicitly says whether it's going to be the third temple built by the Jews or whether it's going to be one built by us. Although Bruce R. McConkie says that uh, it would be by us. So, and I, I think he's right, or I think it could be kind of like both. I could see them building the third temple and then later at the second coming, it uh, being dedicated to the Lord. I, I don't know why that couldn't happen. Um, and we've discussed the possibility of the BYU Jerusalem Center. I have an entire playlist about it. Um, go check it out. Before you type any comments about how it can't be a temple, go watch the playlist. Um so anyway, let's continue. Okay, so they're they're waiting for the third temple to be, uh, to come into being, and uh, they see this as a sign. Okay, that Jerusalem will return to its former days of glory. Okay, now at the end of the article, it says the last time foxes were sighted in the area was 2019. So this is not the first time. I decided to go ahead and put it on my timeline right here. So. We have uh, the time that it happened in 2019 on uh, the 7th of August. And then I put it up here at the top, this most recent sighting. Interestingly, this happened on the same day that Lucille Randon um, passed away. She was the oldest living Catholic nun. Um, she's part of this series or this set of people that are dying that... Uh, are the longest living and symbolize a certain thing like the Catholic Church or um, Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, so on and so forth. So that that's just kind of weird that those two things happen on the same day. So I wanted to see what happened back in 2019. And uh, there's some more. Okay, August 7th. 2019. It's also interesting that both the dates have a seven in it, right? The 17th and then on the seventh. Okay. Foxes at Temple Mount. Prophetic proof Jerusalem returning to glory. Also by Adam Berkowitz. 
In a graphic materialization of the prophecy of Zechariah, as explained in the Talmud, foxes are, are now being seen playing at the, te the Temple Mount. And then he talks about uh, an article in Yeshiva, and I have that pulled up here. Um, I'm not going to read anything out of here, but it, it does have a video in case you want to see that. And uh, it talks about the same thing. Okay. Wild foxes at the site of the destroyed temple are described specifically in the Jewish Talmud. This Talmud, uh, which was written 2,000 years ago as a sign that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, this, preci this precise scenario was discussed in the Talmud in Makot 24b. Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi El Elazar ben Azaria, Rabbi Joshua, and Ra Rabbi Akiva went up to Jerusalem. When they reached the Temple Mount, they saw a fox emerging from the place of the Holy of Holies. The others started weeping, but Rabbi Akiva laughed. Rabbi Akiva asked the rabbis why they cried, and they explained that to see a wild animal in such a holy place, a place which was forbidden to unfit men, was distressing. Rabbi Akiva noted that this was precisely the reason he laughed. He explained that the fact that the prophecy of Uriah related by the prophet Micah had come to pass was proof that the prophecy of Zechariah would also come to be. Right? So in other words, this was prophesied. So we know that now this prophecy, you can check it off the list, and now we're moving on to Zechariah's. Okay, the prophet Micah, not to be confused with Malachi, uh, the prophet Micah described the total destruction of Jerusalem in Micah 3.12. Um, assuredly, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, uh, shall become heaps of ruins, and the Har Habayit, a shrine in the woods. The prophet Zechariah described the return of Jerusalem to its days of glory. Thus, say, thus, thus said the Lord of hosts, There shall yet be old men and women in the squares of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of their great age. And the squares of the city shall be crowded with boys and girls playing in the squares. As the focus of Jewish prayer and the site of the future temple, the Temple Mount has frequently been the scene of prophetic images. On, or sorry, in July 2018, a large segment of one of the stones of the wall suddenly fell, barely missing a woman. Last year... Uh, so, yeah, because when this was 2019, right? So, okay, again in 2018, last year during the morning prayers of the last day of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, a strange mist rose from the ground and covered the Dome of the Rock. I'm going to have to go back and read that story, and I'll do a video about that, and I'll add it to my uh, my timeline. Just a few weeks earlier, a snake crawled out from between the ancient stones. At around the same time, strange sinkholes appeared adjacent to the Sha'ar Harakimim, uh, which the Palestinians later turned into a mosque. So I'm going to have to look into that. Here's a video here, too. It's, I guess it's probably the same video. I, I don't know. Looks like it probably is. So you can either watch it here on y the Yeshiva world or um, this YouTube video. Uh, the link uh, to it on the Israel 365 site. So <clears throat> that is really, that's really interesting. It's really interesting. Um, I don't know if it's right uh, doctrinally, but I don't really see any like contradiction or anything like that. And uh, I think it's, it's probably true. It's probably true. It's interesting that we go from this, right? This is the second temple. This is not Solomon's temple. But either way, uh, you have this just a beautiful, beautiful structure building. You know, there's Jerusalem back there. By the way, this is the virtual New Testament by BYU. You can download this for free. And uh, you can walk around down there in the temple. But you go from this uh, to this, right? Again, things are looking better now, but... Um, my understanding is that after the diaspora, after the Romans, you know, 
force the Jews out of Jerusalem and Israel. Uh, you know, the land was just kind of desolate. There wasn't much going on here. It's now coming to life. Uh, but this is the current situation. Um, this is currently possessed by another religion, right? We do have the BYU Jerusalem Center over here. Let's come over here. You see BYU Jerusalem Center in a, a pretty prime, on a pretty prime piece of real estate uh, just north of the Mount of Olives. Here's the Mount of Olives. And uh, it's part of the same mountain range, although it's technically on Mount Scopus. This is Mount Scopus over here. But it's very, very close. So, interesting that we would have a fox, you know, as described in Scripture, uh, running up here. And then a, a few years before, some of them playing together. Um, and what's interesting about this, you guys, is that in both instances, this ha has happened during President Nelson's presidency. He became president of the church January of 2018. So both of these sightings have happened during his time. I don't know if there's been other documented cases. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to look into it further, but I still think that it's probably pretty significant. Um, let's go ahead and zoom out. So here you go. Here's Jerusalem. Here's West Jerusalem over here. Uh, this is more, it's like the newer part. And then here's the old city right here, which is typically what you find, you know, especially like really old cities. You go to Europe, you go to the center of the city and it's uh, still just like teeny tiny streets and very squished together. And then you go to the outskirts and it's more um, spaced out and modern. But, uh, you know, the, the, the country is coming to life. And I mean, look at this. I, I mean, this is a pretty big, um, well, I, don't, I actually don't know. I, I'd have to compare it to something. There's Bethlehem right there. But, uh, you know, you can see there's a lot of development around here. And it's probably just going to continue, most likely. Jerusalem is definitely, it's definitely been built up, right? The missing piece is the temple. Um, unless currently the BYU Jerusalem Center can be that uh, whenever the Lord decides to do that, if he does. If not, then I guess we'll be waiting on this or maybe even something else. Who knows? All right, so let's go ahead and... Let's see what Ezra Taft Benson said in 1950. At this time, he wasn't uh, president of the church. He was in the Quorum of the Twelve. But uh, this must have been, you know, just on their minds, being so close to that time where prophecy was fulfilled, when Israel, for the first time in 1,800 years, became a nation again, Right? So I actually haven't read through this. I don't really know what he's going to say, but I think I can guarantee it's going to be good. So let's, uh, let's go back in time and see what was said two years after Israel became a nation. My beloved brethren and sisters, if I may have an interest, if I may, <coughs> sorry, if I may have an interest in your faith and prayers and a portion of the spirit of the Lord, I desire to give expression to a few thoughts which I have had in my heart since returning from the shores of war torn Europe some three years ago. Yeah, because remember, World War III, that, that was just, you know, like five years ago uh, at this point. Um, well, actually, I think the war in Europe, didn't that end in 1943? When did World War II end in Europe? Um, let's see, Victory in Europe Day. That's what I'm looking for. Oh, no, it went all the way to 1945. Okay. All right, so just like five years ago, a miraculous drama. I should like to speak with reference to a rather miraculous drama that is taking place today before our very eyes. In large measure, it is unobserved, uh, particularly 
by spiritual leaders, and yet it has been predicted by the by prophets anciently thousands of years ago, and in modern times has referred to has been referred to frequently in latter day prophets during the past one hundred and twenty years. Now look at that. <clears throat> look at that. And I think that this same thing is happening today. Like things are happening, but they're not being recognized as prophecy. You know, I'm not so sure that most prophecy is just like so obvious. I think it kind of, you know, flies under the the radar and only those that are spiritually in tune, um, that have the eyes to see and ears to hear, realize it, right? And Jeffrey R. Holland last year in the UK, well, not just there, but he said it another time that he, he was like, uh, in fact, I think I have it recorded. Let me go to... I don't know if it's under common misconceptions. Yeah, here it is. I need to add more. This is not Jeffrey R. Holland. This is Hubie Brown. But look what he says. All right. He says, I want to say to you, brethren, that in the midst of all the troubles, the uncertainties, the uh, tumult and chaos through which the world is passing, almost unnoticed by the majority of the people of the world, there has been set up a kingdom, a kingdom over which God the Father presides and Jesus Christ uh, is the king. That kingdom is rolling forward, as I say, partly unnoticed, but it is rolling forward with a power and a force that will stop the enemy in its tracks while some of you live. I'm going to highlight that, turn that red, partly unnoticed. Yeah, I, I have to work on this portion here because there's, there's many other quotes the misconception is the signs of the times will be very obvious, just like big, huge things. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Okay, let's go back to the talk. Okay, and, and think about this. This is a big one. I Israel becoming a nation again. And, and, and from what I can tell, okay, just talking to people, it seems like evangelicals and other Christians haven't really been as interested in Israel as they have the last maybe like 10, 20 years for some reason. You'd think that they'd be all excited back then, but from what I can tell, just the general feeling I get is that they haven't really gotten that excited about it until recently, relatively speaking. Okay, in spiritual matters, mankind seems inclined to worship the past and ignore new revelation of the present. <laughs> yep. Uh, people generally revere prophets dead and persecute or ignore the living while disregarding current fulfillment of ancient and modern prophecy. This condition was evidenced in the meridian of time as the people proclaimed Moses and Abraham and rejected the greatest of all prophets, yea, even the redeemer of the world. In large, me in large measure, the same spirit characterizes the present. Yeah, totally. To yeah, totally. That is totally the case. They're all important. They are all important, but we have to be aware of what's happening right now, you know, with our current profit and our current circumstances. It's an ongoing story. Uh, the great event of which I speak is one of the signs of the times that is very important, it seems to me, particularly to all Christian people. It is transpiring in, sm in a small strip of country about... 110 miles long and 50 to 60 miles wide in an area about the size of the state of Vermont. This little section has a population of approximately 3 million, divided as follows. About 1.7 million Arabs, approximately 140,000 Christians, and other relatively minor sects, and about 1 million descendants of Judah, the son of Jacob. And uh, when I was talking to Ellie Michelle, if you missed that interview, we were actually talking about this, that at the time that Israel became a nation, there were only like 600,000. There were only 600,000 of them, the uh, Jews in the land. Six, like, not even a million. Okay. And now today, let's see, population of Israel... Now it's up to 9.3 million. So it's really, gro it's really grown. 
Um, I'm not going to go into a whole thing, but the number of Jews in the world um, is about the same as the number of members of the church. So it's interesting. There's parallels there, but I've already done videos about that. Okay, the number of Jews has multiplied in recent years in this area in a rather remarkable manner. Plans are underway for the incorporation of about a million and a half more during the immediate months ahead, and projected plans call for an eventual population of some four million in this small area. Well, it's definitely exceeded that by now in 2023. This one and a half million to be added during the next few months, according to plans, will bring approximately 200,000 Jews from the displaced persons camps throughout war-torn Europe, about 700,000 other European Jews, some 600,000 now living in Muslim countries, and approximately 100,000 from other continents. In connection with this great drama, it seems to me that the words of the Lord through Isaiah are being fulfilled again, namely that in the last days the Lord would proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder that the wisdom of their wise men should perish and the understanding of their prudent men should be hid. All right. Um, while in Europe uh, in 1946, when mention was frequently made in the European papers of the Jewish problem, I received a comment from one of our great industrial leaders in this country who is a student of this particular problem, in which he said the only salvation the Jew has is to be a good citizen, as he possibly can, of whatever country he is a resident. Then later, one of our prominent business leaders quoting a high church authority whose church numbers whose church numbers into many millions in the South American countries stated that the Jewish people would uh, do their cause much more good if they attempted to move their people from places where they are not wanted to places where they are wanted. For example, South America, uh, where, there, where there's ample room. As Latter-day Saints familiar with ancient and modern prophecies, uh, we of course do not agree that some other more suitable place would be and will be found for the descendants of Judas. We believe in the overruling power of providence in the affairs of men and nations. We believe that the Old Testament prophets clearly predicted the dispersion and scattering of Israel and the eventual gathering of Judah in the land given to their fathers. Some of our magazines, I guess I'll read these section titles, Lack of Wisdom. Some of our magazines have commented editorially on this same problem. I have before me a quotation made in 1948 from one of our most popular magazines and reprinted in the New York Herald Tribune, <clears throat> which has a wide circulation through their European edition printed in Paris, in which the author states, What the Jews really need is not a national state, but the right sort of world. If the nations carried out the provisions in the United Nations Charter for universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, it would do far more to solve the Jewish problem than any multiplication of the Jewish population in Palestine. In 1949, about a year ago, the United States News and World Report commented on the miscalculations of government officials and military experts with reference to the outcome of the struggle between or the struggle be, then being waged in Palestine. It reported that the quote prophecies of the military experts in particular have had to be revised end quote. Then it continued by outlining the predictions of military authorities in our own country and in Great Britain, particularly to the effect that it was only a matter of a very brief time until the Jews would be overcome and wiped out and the Arabs would win, uh, quote, the Arabs would win quick control of Palestine. Um, now, the article continues, these officials, but these official but private fo forecasters are in a state of confusion. And the U.S. and Britain, as a result, have to adjust their diplomacy, their military strategy, to this fact of a strong Israel in the midst of Arab weakness. You know, this might be something that I'll have to cover in the future on the channel. Um, it really is a miracle that they've survived to this point. Um, let's take a quick look at my uh, Rising Generation tab. Let's see, timeline, rising generation. 
Originally, I made this because we were looking at Joseph Smith's uh, prophecy. Well, no, I. Uh, this is a collection of all the different statements made about certain generations. But uh, in one of the most recent videos, Joseph Smith said that there were people in the in the rising generation that would see Christ when he comes, and so I kind of charted it out. And uh, I put a little place here for Israel, um, starting in 1948, just to kind of keep track of how old Israel is as a nation. And uh, right now, it is, or it's going to be, in May, 75 years old. 75 um, I don't know if that's significant or not. Uh, there's this line of thinking, mostly among evangelicals, <clears throat> that there's a there's a, there's this idea of a fig tree generation. Uh, they get it from Matthew 24, where it talks about the fig tree, and the way that they interpret it is when Israel became a nation. Um, it, it represents the 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 fig tree represents Israel. Okay, and so, um. Christ said that there were those of that generation when they say when they see all these things that Christ predicted would happen in the last days that that generation would not pass away until uh, Christ comes and so they look at Israel they take a definition of a generation from a psalm I think it's Psalms Psalms uh, 90 verse 10 where Moses says that it's 70 years and if by strength 80 years and so, as you can see, if they're right about that, and I don't know that they are, but if they're right about that in any way, uh, we're kind of like right in that time. Israel turned 70, uh, interestingly enough, in 2018 when President Nelson became uh, president of the church. That's a very interesting year for Israel uh, to become, to turn 70, because 70 is a highly um, significant number right? It really is. So I don't think that's by coincidence. You know, now we're, we're coming up on 75. 75 can be seen as three quarters, right? Three quarters of a hundred. It's one of those just nice round numbers. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it, if that means anything, but anyway, let's, let's go back to the talk. Okay. Oh, the, the 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 point is that they've survived all these years, going on seventy five years, and uh, not only have they survived, but they they're thriving. Okay. Okay. It seems as though this probably is more evidence of the fact that the wisdom of the wise shall perish. The prophecies of economists would be uh, would be statesmen and military experts fail, while those of the Lord through His prophets are vindicated. And that right there is a very important concept. Okay. You have, you do have smart people. You have people that understand, uh, the field that they're in, uh, whether it's science, military, business, politics, da, 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 da. They, they know what they're talking about, but when it comes to things like this, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Okay. We should listen to, the scriptures, we should listen to the prophets and apostles, general authorities, because when it comes down to it, they know more, even if it goes against the conventional wisdom of these experts. And I'm I'm not gonna say that they're not experts, but you know, they don't know everything. They don't. Okay, an interesting side okay, an interesting sidelight on this recent development is the fact that many of the descendants of Judah who have assembled in Palestine seem to look upon the events of the last few months as being nothing short of miraculous. It is a common comment among them that victory, in their eyes at least, was a miracle which cannot be explained in purely military terms. Some of our recently returned missionaries from Europe who have visited the land bring back the same report. Prophecies clear. Now the prophecies are very clear with reference to the dispersion and scattering of Israel and Judas. And if you're listening to this, I'm not adding the S at the end. That's how it's written. Judas. That's how, what he's saying. Um, he means Judah, of course. He's just an alternate pronunciation. Uh, Moses, Ezekiel, Amos, Jeremiah, and others made clear predictions that Judah would be scattered. 
The master referred to it when asked by his disciples for a sign, uh, for a sign as the end of the world. The Lord said, oh, here we go. Um, and they, oh no, this is from Luke 21. This is like the equivalent of, of Matthew 24, Luke 21. And they, referring to the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jeremiah made it clear that they, the Jews, would be persecuted with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and the Lord would, quote, deliver them to be removed to all kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them, uh, because they have not hearkened to my word, saith the Lord, end quote. Is it possible that the times of the Gentiles are nearing their fulfillment, that the time is approaching when the gospel will be carried to the descendants of Judah? I think one of the saddest chapters in history is the account of the dispersion and suffering of Judah. Now, that's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm still working on nailing this down, but nothing has really changed uh, the more that I've looked into it. The times of the Gentiles. There's basically two parts to it. One part is Jerusalem itself. Is it in the possession of the Jews or is it not? Because after they were kicked out by the Romans, uh, Jerusalem was had by different peoples. But now that time has come to an end. It's no longer being, being trodden underfoot by Gentiles. It's now in the possession of Judah, right? And then in terms of, uh, that's like one part of it. The other part is the taking of the gospel to the Jews, and I would argue that's been happening ever since the the beginning of this dispensation. We we don't like <clears throat> we, we don't we're not targeting specific people when we go out and do missionary work. And Jews live throughout the entire world, not just Israel. In fact, they haven't returned to Israel really until 1948. We had been doing missionary work all you know all, all the years preceding that, back to uh, 1830. I actually don't know when missionary work officially started, but let's just say all the way back to 1920. And I know of Jews that have uh, joined the church. Uh, we did the, uh, I'll pull it up again. We did the anonymous survey. Where is it? Which tribe of Israel are you from? The responses that we got back are this. After Ephraim and Manasseh, the next largest groups um, are Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. These are Jews. Whether they would be traditionally like accepted by Jews themselves, because Jews look at the matrilineal line, we know that the Lord would consider them of these three tribes, Judah, Benjamin, Levi. That's the next biggest group uh, from my survey that I did. Some of them would be recognized as Jews by other Jews because uh, they have that ancestry. Other ones may uh, may may not uh, qualify that way if they were to like go to a rabbi and be like, "Can you qual? You know, can you here? You, you know, it's the rabbi would be like, "Well, no, you don't have a mother, you don't have a matrilineal line, so you're not Jew." But I don't think that the Lord goes by that definition. So there's probably a lot of people out there that wouldn't fit the the Jewish definition of Jew, but they do the Lord's definition, right? But the fact of the matter is that um, it is it is reaching the Jews. And even today, uh, not all the Jews are in Israel. Um, let's see, list of Jewish, po Jewish population by country. Yeah, let's do that. I've looked at this before, but let's just do it again. So look at this. Most Jews live in the United States, 51%, according to this. 51%, more than half of them live in the United States. Do you think that missionaries aren't coming across them? Or in France, or Canada, or R Russia, or United Kingdom, or Argentina, Germany, Australia, all the countries of the world? I'm not sure why... 
I feel like there's like this misconception about um, like the gospel has to be taught in the land of Israel because that's not what de- what defines the Jewish people. It's a big part of it. They're supposed to be there. Um, here's another table. Now this is going by, they break it down in different categories. You have the core population, you have the connected population, the enlarged population and the eligible population. So there's different ways you have. Like if I remember right, the core population are those that identify themselves as, as Jews. They're like, I am Jewish and I can prove it. And then you have kind of like the outliers, um, that are family members and they could probably prove it. And then you have like, it, it, you know, it just kind of spreads out. You have those that are, that don't identify themselves as Jew, but they could verify it if they, if they wanted to, they could be like, Oh, well, yeah, I, I do have Jewish ancestry and it's through my mother's line. So anyway, that's what we're looking at here. So this table is according to the core population. And, uh, and here you go. So, 6.3 million in Israel, according to this, of the core population, and then 5.7 in the United States. And then you have all these other countries. Jews are all over the place. It doesn't have to go to Israel, right? And I haven't seen anything to indicate that, that that's what's going to happen in order to uh, end the times of the Gentiles. I haven't seen anything that says that. So anyway, let's go back. Okay, so <clears throat> sufferings of Judah. I have before me a quotation of Will Durant in his book, The Story of Civilization, in which he states that, quote, no people in history fought so tenaciously for liberty as the Jews, nor any other people against such odds. He says further, no other people has ever known so long an exile or so hard a fate. Then referring to the siege of Jerusalem under Titus, lasting for 134 days, during which uh, 1,110,000 Jews perished and 97,000 were taken captive, he states that the Romans destroyed 987 towns in Palestine and slew 580,000 men, and a still larger number, uh, we are told, perished through starvation, disease, and fire. Nearly all Judea was laid waste. So many Jews were sold as slaves that their price fell to that of a horse. Thousands hid in underground channels rather than be captured. Uh, in fact, that's the story of Josephus. Like he, uh, I was listening to Henry Abrams, Abramson, and he was telling the story of Josephus, which is the famous Jewish historian. Um, he, and he seems to be kind of an unsavory character. He, uh, he was with a group of other soldiers and they were in a cave and they knew that they were going to be overtaken. They were going to be captured. And so they were talking amongst themselves and they're like, you know what? Instead of being captured, let's just, we'll kill ourselves. And so they did that until the last two people, uh, which included Josephus and the other guy. And then he's like, well, you know what? Wouldn't it be sad if we didn't tell the story or whatever? And so he, he, be, he got captured and then the Romans, um, used him uh, as a as a historian uh, because I guess he you know he knew the history of the Jews and whatever I don't have all the details but it basically went like that so it's interesting that he brought that up okay scarcely 8,000 Jews were left in all of Palestine even their banishment and scattering didn't end their persecution efforts were made to drive them from various countries some nations made an effort to banish them completely uh, they were accursed of causing or accused of causing the Black Death that spread through Europe in 1348, and many Jews were crucified there, therefore. I have said nothing regarding the Crusades and the dastardly deeds perpetrated in the name of Christianity upon the remaining Jews in Palestine. Yes, the prophecies regarding the dispersion and the suffering of Judah have been fulfilled, but the gathering and reestablishment of the Jews is also clearly predicted gathering of Israel. The gathering has three phases. The gathering gathering of Israel to the land of Zion, uh, the American hemisphere, the return of the 10 tribes from the countries of the north, and the reestablishment of the Jews in Palestine as God's chosen people. This miracle of the return of Jew, of the Jews 
was to be one of the events to precede Christ's second coming. And the scriptures are very clear with reference to this fact. Isaiah said that they shall gather, uh, quote, the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth and set them in their own land that they will build the old way. They will build the old waste and repair the waste cities. Jeremiah, who predicted so clearly their dispersion, also states that the Lord will, quote, cause them to return to the land which I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it, and build them as at the first. The prophets of the Book of Mormon even more clearly predicted the conditions under which they will gather. These prophets also foresaw the time when they would begin to believe in Jesus Christ, that the kings of the Gentiles would be as nursing fathers and their queens nursing mothers in helping to bring about their return. These prophets make it clear that eventually the fullness of the gospel will be carried to Jerusalem and the descendants of Judah. Now, on that note, uh, one thing that we've been watching, and I, I want to like watch it even closer, is... Let's go to this. Let's go to the second coming timeline. The Over here in column M on the far right of the screen, the Messianic Jewish movement. The Messianic Jewish movement. There have been many Jews that have started to accept Christ. And it's a, it's a rather recent phenomenon. So let me find when it changed. Okay, so where is it? Oh, we got to go down to the 1960s. Okay, so right here. And it's not like an official date. They just kind of approximately date it. So <clears throat> starting sometime in the, the 60s, you had the Messianic Jewish movement, movement that began. Uh, it comes from the offshoots or its predecessor, the Hebrew Christian movement. Okay. So it, it took a turn, it hit a new phase once it, once it reached the 60s. And the Hebrew Christian movement traces its history back to, interesting, interestingly enough, 1809. And in 1813, you had the first identifiable congregation made up exclusively of Jews who had converted to Christianity called Benny Abraham established in the United Kingdom, which was seven years before the first vision. Seven. Seven. Um, I don't think that that's a coincidence. I don't think that's a coincidence that seven years before the first vision, you have the first Christian congregation made up entirely of Jews. Okay. And uh, I think there was one other. No, maybe not. Maybe not. 1920. And then 11 years before. And a lot of times people look at 11 as kind of a symbolic number. Um, that's when you have what's kind of considered the beginning of the Hebrew Christian movement. So this is something that's been going on around the same time as the Restoration. Interestingly. I'm really, really wanting to talk to messianic jew i've had a hard time doing that but I, I guess i could put in a little bit more work and try and make that happen but i think it's fascinating that you have this movement among jews where they're accepting christ okay that's going on right now it's it's only getting bigger okay so um so yeah, the prophets of the Book of Mormon even more clearly predicted the conditions under which they will gather. These prophets all also foresaw the time when they would begin to believe in Jesus Christ. That seems to be happening right now. Even though they don't have the fullness of the gospel, um, the Lord works with people, countries and peoples and tribes and whatever, in stages. It, you can't, it, it doesn't just like happen overnight. Uh, it can, but typically... He works with an entire people through stages and phases, line upon line, precept upon precept. And uh, accepting Christ is, is a really big and important step, isn't it? Um, that the kings of the Gentiles would be as nursing fathers and their queens nursing mothers and helping to bring about their return. 
These prophets make it clear that eventually the fullness of the gospel will be carried to Jerusalem and to the descendants of Judah. Okay, well, there it is. T- carried to Jerusalem. Second Nephi 10, 7 through 9. Um, covenant restored. Okay. Dispersion, earth, nation of the Gentiles. Da, da, da. Well, I didn't see anything about Jerusalem in there, but anyway, in our day, uh, in that first visit of Moroni to the prophet Joseph, to the prophet Joseph mention was made that the dispersed of Judah would be gathered from the four corners of the earth. 13 years later, when Moses delivered the keys for the gathering of Israel and the Kirtland Temple was dedicated, the prophet Joseph made further reference to the promises made to Judah and appealed to the Lord that the time may soon come when the children of Judah would return to the land uh, promised to their father Abraham. In some of the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, particularly the 133rd section, Reference is also made to the fact that the elders would go to the nations of the earth, to the Gentiles first, and also to the Jews, that the, that the Jews would flee to Jerusalem, and that Judah, after their pain, shall be sanctified. Yeah, so the Gentiles first, and then also to the Jews, so that, right? Because that's what he's saying here. So missionary work first to the Gentiles and then after that to the Jews so that the Jews would flee to Jerusalem. Now, I I don't know if any of that's happened. Um, I don't know if there's like any Jews that have accepted the gospel, become members of the church um, and have gone to Israel, but that would be fascinating if that's, you know, if that happens. Um, you know, let's go to the, let's see, LDS Meeting House Locator. If I'm not mistaken, I think there are, there is like a meeting house there, but I think it's for just like the BYU Jerusalem Center. I'm not sure. Well, look, here's one in Be- Beersheba. What's this called? It just it's just called well it doesn't have like a name because sometimes it'll say the name of the ward. Um, okay, there's this one here. It's probably yeah BYU Jerusalem Center and the Jerusalem branch, which is probably just for the um, yeah it's probably just like the uh, students and stuff. And then Tel Aviv, uh, Tel Aviv branch. I, I and I don't know if that would be somehow in connection with the BYU Jerusalem Center. But it looks like there are at least like three branches there. And then just across the river, the Jordan River, there's a couple branches in uh, Jordan. There's one here in Amman, the Amman branch. And I covered a story about that because um, David A. Bednar went there last year and he spoke at that branch. And then there's this one over here. It doesn't have the name of the branch or, or whatever it is, but uh, that's interesting. If I remember right, I think that there is a member of the church that lives in Jerusalem, and he's a member, and he's Jewish, and he gives tours, I think. Do you know who I'm talking about? So that would be really interesting, though, if you had, like, because I don't know how the law of return works. Israel has a law of return where if you can prove that you're Jewish, um, you're entitled to immigrate to Israel, right? So I just wonder if um, you have to religiously be Jewish. I don't think you do. I think you just have to prove that you are descended. Um, you're a Jewish descendant. I don't know. Anyway, that'd be interesting. If you have any more stories, anecdotes, just things like that. Send them my way. I'd be interested to know. Okay. Dedication of Palestine. As Latter-day Saints from the very inception of this Latter-day work, we have had a deep interest in this group of our father's children, the descendants of Judah. 110 years ago at this very conference, two of the elders of the church, elders Orson Hyde and John E. Page, uh, were called to go to the land of Palestine and dedicate it for the return of the descendants of Judah. 
Ten years before, the Prophet Joseph had predicted on the head of horse and hide that in due time he would go to Jerusalem, the land of his fathers, and be a watchman to that people. History tells us that Elder Hyde did go and dedicate the land in 1841, and in 1873, George, Elder George A. Smith went to the land and again dedicated it for the return of Judas. And uh, Ezra Taft Benson probably isn't going to mention all the times that it's been dedicated, but I have actually recorded that. So here you have, let's go to 1841. So here's Orson Hyde. And then let's go up, up, up. It might be hard to do here. 1873, President George Albert Smith, Elder Lorenzo Snow, and Elder Albert Carrington each individually dedicate the, the Holy Land for the return of the Jews. And uh, th there were multiple dedication. It wasn't just a one-time thing. 1889, Elder Anthony H. Lund, with the assistance of Ferdinand Hintz uh, as the voice of the prayer, dedicates the Holy Land for the gathering of the Jews. And then you have in 1902, there were like three different dedications by the same person. Elder Francis M. Lyman dedicates the Holy Land for the return of the Jews. And he did it three times. Same trip. Um, Elder James E. Talmadge, Talmadge in 1927. He dedicates the Holy Land for the return of Judah. 1933, J. Widso dedicates the Holy Land for the return of Judah. And then, in 1948, Israel becomes a nation. So that's, that's pretty interesting. 15 years after the last uh, dedication. And uh, BYU has an article, BYU Dedications of Israel where um, they have like a table where they, they kind of like chart out what was said in, in each of those prayers right here. So all of, they all uh, blessed and dedicated the land. Not all of them were had Israel or Jews gather, and then missionaries, prophecies fulfilled. Anyway, you can look at this later if you want. Okay, in Elder Hyde's prayer of dedication on the Mount of Olives, he prayed that the barrenness and sterility of the land would be removed, that springs of water would burst forth, that the land would become fruitful again, and that the Lord would subdue their unbelief and incline them to gather in upon this land. He also prayed that God would inspire the kings of the earth to help bring about the promises made to Judah. And, uh, you know, I talked to somebody recently, if you missed it, that has seen this happen, that there's this uh, fresh water uh, more. Well, there's fresh water that's starting to show up near the Dead Sea. And it's like the Dead Sea is starting to be healed. Uh, this girl right here, she moved to Israel. I think she said is like when she was like 20 or about that age. Samantha Siegel, she moved from Illinois to Israel, and since that time, she's been an Israeli citizen, and that's where she lives. She goes to the Dead Sea all the time, had a great interview with her, and she noticed uh, fish showing up really close to um, the Dead Sea. She made news, um, <clears throat> and I, I was lucky enough to be able to get a hold of her, so make sure to check that out if you haven't already. But it is happening. It is happening. And uh, Israel 365 does a really good job keeping up on all these different developments. I don't know how we would know about it without Israel 365. So, and by the way, there's two charities that I am supporting. I'm I'm uh, joined with them to support these charities for Ukrainian orphans that are in Israel, and then the planting of trees um, in Israel. So, if you want to donate to that, and I would encourage you to if you can, uh, the links are in the description below. Okay, going back to this. 
Um, other prophecies were made in connection with this event. Great Britain was referred to particularly as one of the nations which would play a very prominent part in helping to bring this about. And almost immediately following the visit of George, the visit of George A. Smith to this land, organizations began to come into existence, the purpose of which was to sponsor the return of the Jews to the, to the land of Palestine. Now, um, I'm sure you already know, but we have what's called the Orson Hyde Memorial Gardens right here. In fact, I'm going to take off my thing and then I'll click on places. So right here on the Mount of Olives, just right by the, right by um, Gethsemane, you see Gethsemane right here? Just a little, just a tiny bit to the north. That's where you have Orson Hyde's Memorial uh, Park or Memorial Gardens. And, um, I'm sure it'll give us a 360 view here. Let's take a look at it. So here it is. Where, where's the marker? Oh, it's it's right up there. But anyway, you can see right there kind of there's the Dome of the Rock over there. So this is the Temple Mount being blocked by these trees. But this is where that took place. And there's a permanent marker and a plaque and I, I guess a little park or gardens right here um, that belongs to the church and in fact um, they rededicated this recently let's see Orson Hyde Park rededication I came across this recently and uh, this was a this was a situation where, hopefully, see there you have uh, Jeffrey R. Holland right there, and then Elder Cook is right there. Um, you have an Orthodox Jew right here. I don't know who these other people are. And they have a picture. I thought they they had a picture with uh, Jeffrey R. Holland meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's see. Elder Holland, Benjamin, Netanyahu. Yeah, right here. Check this out. Latter-day Saints and Jewish delegation gather at historic Jerusalem site. So, you know, they they know their government knows about this. The, the mayor of Jerusalem, Benjamin Netanyahu, here's Joseph Lieberman. He was a senator here in the United States. You got Jeffrey R. Holland and Elder Cook. You know, here they are. The, these are two witnesses. I'm not saying that they are the two witnesses in Jerusalem. Although I, I have my doubts that they're, that we're going to know that it's happening. And I could see it happening like this, where you just have apostles that go there um, in twos and they talk to the government and who knows everything that they discussed. It may just have been purely about Orson Hyde Memorial Garden, but they may have talked about some other things too. You know, they may have talked about some other things too that we're not privy to. Um, I think this one, this guy, that's the mayor of Jerusalem. Yeah, Mayor Near Barkat. That's him. Then you have Elder Holland right here. So it's really, really cool. It is really, really cool. Really, really cool. All right, let's go back. Okay, Prophecy of Wilford Woodruff. Now, I don't think I, I know what this is, so I'm, in, I'm interested in this. At about the same time, President Wilford Woodruff uttered a very important prophecy, prayer, and testimony with reference to this people in which he said, quote, The Lord has decreed that the Jews should be gathered from all the Gentile nations where they have been driven into their own land in fulfillment of the words of Moses, their lawgiver. And this is the will of your great Elohim. O house of Judah, and whenever you shall be called upon to perform this work, the God of Israel will help you. You have a great future and destiny before you, and you cannot avoid fulfilling it. You are royal. 
uh, you are the royal chosen seed, and the God of your father's house has kept you distinct as a nation for 1,800 years under all the oppression uh, of the whole Gentile world. You may not wait until you believe on you may not wait until you believe on Jesus of Nazareth, but when you meet with Shiloh, your king, you will know him. Your destiny is marked out. You cannot avoid it. So this makes it seem like most of them are not going to know until the second coming, you know, because I am I'm saying that because of the times of the Gentiles. Again, I don't think that there's going to be like a massive like missionary effort in Israel. I just don't think that time is going to come. I think it's probably going to go among Jews all throughout the world, different countries. And basically it's been happening this whole time anyway. Okay, then he said further that the time would come when the armies of the Gentiles would be gathered against them. But he promised further that the time is not far distant when the rich men among the Jews would be called upon to use their abundant wealth to gather the dispersed of Judah and purchase the ancient dwelling places of their fathers in and about Jerusalem and rebuild the holy city and temple. Oh, see? So that's interesting. Wilford Woodruff here is saying that the Jews will build the temple. I'm going to have to start another tracker because uh, Bruce R. McConkie, um, I don't know whether it was by revelation or if it was just his opinion. He seemed to think that it would be uh, the church that would build the temple, but Wilford Woodruff um, is saying otherwise here. I know that Wilford Woodruff spoke with one of the Rothschilds. I did a video about that, and I think I think I remember him saying that same thing there. He was talking to, I can't remember with which Rothschild it was, but he was talking about how you need to go and establish your, your land and build your temple. And so, I don't know. Okay. It is rather significant that up to 1948, more than $700 million has been expanded by, or expended by American Jews alone in helping to bring about the fulfillment of this prophecy by Wilford Woodruff. Um, the part that Great Britain played in the liberating of Palestine from Turkish rule is a matter of history which occurred during World War I in a remarkable manner. Then Lord Balfour, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs for the British government, made a very significant statement of, prophecy, or of policy to the effect that His Majesty's government would view, quote, with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and we will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, end quote. This statement of policy was later supported by the Congress of the United States. It was endorsed by President Wilson and all of his successors uh, that it is the policy of our own land to look with favor upon the establishment of a national home for the descendants of Judah in Palestine. Return of the Jews. So today, my brothers and sisters, in fulfillment of these ancient and modern prophecies, a great drama is being enacted in Palestine. The Jews are returning as one of the events of the last days. Resources are being built up through reclamation, rehabilitation, and modernization. And again, uh, I, I don't want to try and push it too hardly, too hard, but you can donate uh, in the the description box below. You know, pay for a tree to be. Uh, planted. Uh, you can actually help in this effort without actually having to go there. I read the other day of one authority who stated that there is more scientific know-how concentrated today in Palestine than in any other area upon the face of the earth. I wonder if there isn't purpose behind it. I noted too in the report of the Anglo-American Commission, which was made which was made of their study in 1946, that they commented that considerable numbers of the Jews are being converted to Christianity and their attitude toward uh, the Christ as their redeemer of the world is rapidly changing. So right here, he's probably referring to what was at the time being called the, the Hebrew Christian movement, right? And then just a, a decade later, it would... Um, change names and uh, be identified as the Messianic Jewish movement. There has been much confusion, confusion over the Palestine question, much talk of division of the land, of quotas, import restrictions, but 
Out of all of it, I cannot help feeling that we will see a complete fulfillment of the prophecies which have been made regarding this people. These prophecies are in a rapid course of fulfillment before our very eyes today. And you guys, uh, we just saw potentially another one just happen a couple weeks ago with this fox. You know, it's like it's a smaller thing, but, you know, they're taking it serious. At least some of them are. You know, and there's been a lot of things that have been going on. If you go to my uh, timeline here, any any box that's like in this color right here, where it kind of looks like the Israeli flag, it's like a white box with bold blue letters with like the double border like this. Uh, this is what I'm how I'm color coding anything that happens in Israel, right? And uh, there has been a lot. There's been a lot. Here's the one where you had vines growing on the eastern retaining wall of the Temple Mount. And it's spelled out God's name in Hebrew, minus one letter. And not only did it spell it out, but it spelled it out in a particular uh, calligraphy that's used um, for like scrolls and stuff like that. Uh, let's go here. Let's exit out of this. Exit Street View. I'm going to show you where, where it was growing. It was growing right here. Okay, along like right here. That's where the name of God appeared. Do you understand what the significance of this side is? This is the side that faces east. That's the side that faces where Christ is going to come down to the Mount of Olives right here. So on this side, and you can, you can see it. I'll pull it up. I've done a video about it, but let's just uh, make it that much easier for you. Levite, um, name of God on Temple Mount, Vines. I can't remember the, the guy's name. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe there's a second. Oh, this is this is seven months ago. I haven't watched this one, so that one's this one's a little bit newer than this original one. Uh, Yair Levy. Yair Levy is a he's a Levite and uh, he goes up there and just walks and, and there it is. There's the Yod, right? Um, I can't remember what that's called. Dalid? I can't no, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. I have to I have to go back to Duolingo and and uh, remember this. Oh, here's a different one too. Oh, this is this is also Yair Levy. So there it is, God's name showing up in vines in a very significant location. You know, it'd be one thing if it like showed up on um, the south side or the west side, but no, it's on the east side facing toward where Christ is going to come. If, if it's still there, basically Christ is going to land right here and it's going to be right there, like right there. So crazy. Um, Anyway, you can go through my my timeline here and uh, just see all the different things that have hap that have happened. The United States recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital on December sixth, twenty seventeen, just a month before President Nelson becomes a uh, prophet, president of the church. Anyway, all right, let's go back here. Persecution of the Jews. <laughs> While in Europe traveling through the war-torn countries, I was deeply impressed with the fact that the Lord has, the Lord had used as a means of prodding the Jews and bringing about the fulfillment of his pur purposes, the legalized persecution under the great and terrible uh, <laughs> program. Uh, the Jews were persecuted and driven, I presume, like no other people under heaven. I remember standing on the ruins of what was the largest Jewish ghetto in Europe, uh, in the Jewish section of Warsaw, Poland, in August 1946. Uh, there, we were given a description of what had transpired as being somewhat typical of that which had gone, had gone on in various parts of Europe through the establishment of the medieval ghetto. Here, 250,000 descendants of Judah had lived prior to the war. Under the <laughs> rule, through forced labor, they were required to build a wall around the ghetto. Later, some 150,000 Jews from other parts of Europe were brought into that area. 
Then finally, the entire section was destroyed, wiped out by bombing after the people had been robbed and ravaged. Um, as we stood on the crumbled brick and mortar and the rumble some 15 feet deep with only the spire of one burnt synagogue showing no other building in that vast area we were told by the guy that some 200,000 bodies it was estimated still remained under the rubble of those once great buildings in this section of warsaw we visited some of the co the concentration camps and the crematoriums that were where it is estimated six million of the sons and daughters of Judah lost their lives, reduced, reducing their world population from 17 to 11 million. That that is such a big, that is such a large amount. That is so almost like catastrophic. It was catastrophic. Um, but determined to determination to return. We were impressed almost to tears as we visited some of these wanderers, these persecuted and driven sons of our Heavenly Father, to find how doggedly they were determined to return to Palestine. Oftentimes, or oft times, as they would come into relief agencies to get temporary help, we would ask them why they did not settle nearby. Sometimes they were invited to stay. But they had one desire, and that was re to return to the land of their fathers. I recall that a survey was made by... UNRRA, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, in which they interviewed 3,629 Jews in displaced persons camps to determine what they would like to do if they were given their freedom to move and locate as they pleased. Of this number, 3,619 3, 3, indicated that they would like to go back to Palestine. Nine of them expressed a desire to come to the United States and one to Australia. This desire, which is almost a passion, uh, was so great that it was as strong as life itself. Of course, much of the movement then was done through the underground and by smuggling. I hold in my hand a short clipping, one of many we took from the papers in London. This one is entitled 100 Jew Ships Now. It is taken from the London Evening News, November 5th, 1946. It is an Associated Press dispatch and reads... Quote, British naval intelligence officers in Jerusalem revealed today that Jewish underground has has bought at least 100 ships, many paid for with U.S. funds to carry refugees to Palestine from southern European ports. Crews are promised 10 ahead for each refugee smuggled into Palestine, Associated Press. Future events. Yes, my brethren and sisters, this great drama goes on before our very eyes, in large measure unnoticed to the Christian world, which, which is just unbelievable. Um, one hardly ever hears reference to the prophecies regarding Judah's return, yet the promises are clear that it would be one of the great events of the last days. And of course, we know from modern revelations and prophecies that much more is yet to occur. Read the 14th chapter of Zechariah and the 11th chapter of Revelation with reference to other great events that are yet to come, affecting directly this chosen people. Um, he, this is referencing uh, the two witnesses, right? Um, the two witnesses, the two candlesticks, as they're also known. Da, 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 da. And then Zechariah. This is probably... I don't know. I'm not going to read it. Uh, maybe I should. But behold, the day of the Lord cometh. No, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Okay. Let's go to the church website and just read the chapter heading. Okay. Old Testament. Zechariah. And what was it? Chapter 14. Oh, it's the very, it's the last chapter. Um, at his second coming, the Lord will fight for Israel. His feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. Uh, he will be a king over all the earth. Plagues will destroy the wicked. Okay. So, yeah. So he's referring to uh, the two witnesses and then, the, you know, the second coming. 
Okay, with reference to the other great events that are yet to come, affecting directly this chosen people, the House of Judah. Eventually, their city will be encompassed by Gentile armies. Yes, during during their last great struggle, the Master will make his appearance uh, as the Mount of Olives cleaves in twain for their protection. Then, no doubt, will be, re- will be realized the fulfillment of the glorious statement by, made by the Lord in the Doctrine and Covenants through the Prophet Joseph's through the prophet joseph uh this is what this is what always what happens with long videos i lose my ability to talk uh through the prophet joseph with reference to judah which i read in conclusion and then shall the jews look upon me and say what are these wounds in in twine hand okay that's a typo what are these wounds in thine hands and in thy feet Then shall they know that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities, and they shall lament because they persecuted their king. God help us, my brothers and sisters, to realize the importance of these great and stirring events as signs that the second coming of the Master is approaching rapidly. And may, may they be the means of emphasizing uh, to us the importance of putting our own houses in order, maintaining the faith, and doing all in our power to help further the glorious work of the latter day. Of the latter day, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, yeah, that was a pretty amazing talk. You know, again, 1950, he says that it's approaching rapidly. So at this point in uh, 2023 it's got to be super soon. You know, I I really, I really do think that that is the case. Um, When it comes to Jerusalem being surrounded. Yeah. Everything that I've read, it seems like that's literally going to happen. There's literally going to be a war. Um, Although I wonder if it's already kind of started happening now, even since the inception of, uh, well, not since the inception, but since Israel became a nation, they were, (laughs) immediately attacked in this entire time that they've been a nation. Um, they've been surrounded by hostile forces, uh, both militarily and politically throughout the world. Everyone's against Israel. And, um, you know, at, a, at, at any given time, things could erupt in a way that we don't think. You know, it seems like Iran is pretty intent on uh, destroying Israel. So who's to say that something crazy couldn't happen all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, who's to say that what's going on with Russia and Ukraine can't spread because Russia has, um, allies in the Middle East, in, uh, Syria, which borders Israel and Iran and, uh, things could go crazy. Turkey has been, uh, particularly, I think they've been hostile recently to toward Israel under uh, Erd- Erdogan or Erdogan or whatever his name is. Things can happen very quickly. Very very quickly. Um Okay, I think that's it. I think that's it. So the most recent thing that I'm aware of is this. This fox on the Temple Mount which they are paying attention to. All right. Well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.